This presentation is a case study of how to use a user-defined function in the Arduino IDE. The particular application is in reading a sensor that has fluctuations, so the user-defined function will average many of those readings in order to do, estimate the average value of the thing being measured. This plot shows how a signal might be coming in from a sensor. Each dot represents a measurement. The horizontal axis is time, and this simulates a measurement over the course of, say, three minutes, uh, each reading taken once a second. Uh, the average rep is represented by the dashed horizontal line, and for this particular set of numbers, the average is 681. The inset shows an alternative view, which is a kind of a histogram. Each circle represents a reading. Since these are integer values on a 10-bit scale, the readings will repeat, even though they're slightly different from each other. The rounding gives you an integer value, and the values stack up when they're repeated. More values are repeated in the center. Uh, fewer values are repeated at the edges. This suggests a tendency for all those measurements in the first plot, showing measurements versus time, to clump uh, near a central value, in this case, uh, 681. We'll define that to be representative of this entire set. We're going to compute the average of n readings. x sub i is a, a symbol used to designate an individual reading, reading i, and we're going to add up those readings, 1 to n, divide by n, and we get the average. If we're going to do this in a code, a computer code, we want it to work for any, any number n. And to do that, the calculation needs to be implemented as an accumulating sum. Here's a symbolic representation of that. Let s be the sum, the variable that stores the sum. And initially, we set s to 0. The left arrow here suggests an operation. We have a value 0, and we assign it to s. In the next line, we assign s to be the prior value of s plus x1. The next line, the prior value of s plus x2, etc. So in this way, we accumulate the sum into s. We divide by n, and we get the average. Here is a, a little code snippet that shows how that would show up in an Arduino program. According to our case study, the x sub i's are individual readings returned by the analog read function. So we declare two variables, av and sum. Sum accumulates the sum of the n readings. Sum plus equals notation says that we take the prior value of sum and add the current value of analog read. So we get uh, n of those values stored in sum. After the loop is over, we divide by n read, the number of readings, and we get our average value. Here's our code again. And what we want to do is create a module that does this. So the code is there. It's correct. It could be used. But if we're going to create a module, let's put a box around this code. And figuratively, this is our function. And it has inputs that we're going to supply, pin, the analog input channel, pin number, and n read, the number of readings we want to make on that pin. The output is average. The goal is to create a module that can be used for any pin and separately any number of readings. When we're done, we could treat this as a black box. The, you know, the calculations are not mysterious or complex, but when we are using this function in another context, we don't need to worry exactly how sum is accumulated, uh, what the variable name is that stores the sum, what even the variable name that uh, stores the average. So we just know that we supply the appropriate inputs, pin and, and read, and we get an output f. This is a crucial idea that is beneficial and uh, used in a lot of different situations. So first, let's just review that. Code uh, that uses functions can be debugged once and then reused. So once we get our function to do the average reading, we don't need to remember how to start it up again. We've stored it. We've, we've got this reusable function. And we can treat it like a black box. We can then mix other modules uh, like that. So we now have a, a little bit of a toolbox. When we do that, our main program, in this case the loop function, is more compact. Uh, instead of many statements in order to execute this averaging of the input channel, we simply call our function. That makes the main program easier to read and to understand. And for example, what if you were going to read several sensors, two, three sensors? Without the standalone function, you would have to make copies of this code, changing only the variables that affect 
the pin number and the number of readings you'd want to average, and they would all be smashed together in a section of code that would make your code harder to read or certainly harder to, to grasp all at once. And that's a benefit to make code simple. It doesn't, you know, the function is still there, the statements are still there, they're not, they've not gone away, but by organizing them in a way that is modular, you can make your main code easier to read. So in general, the, the net effect here is your code is more robust. Um, the computations that happen inside the function are only affected by the input, so you're not going to accidentally change a variable might change the outcome. Say if this back to this earlier idea that if you had three sensors, you're going to paste the same code one after each other and then change n for one of them and not want to change n for another one, for example, the number of readings, you'd have to keep track of that. So by using structured code, you're less likely to make an error by changing something that affected something else. Modules also reduce accidental modification. So in other words, because the code is inside the function, you're not going to, if you use the a variable like av someplace else in your code and you change its value, it doesn't affect the value inside the function. Back to this notion of modular code, because you have a, a library or at least some reusable codes, you start thinking about how you can use those in new applications and the new application work gets simpler. So everything gets more effective by putting effort into building reusable pieces. So this is the end result. It's a function called sensor average and we're going to look at the parts of this function in the subsequent slides, but there's no secrets here. This is not particularly complicated. The body of the code evaluates this accumulated sum and then divides that sum by the number of readings. Uh, the, the new features are the inputs and outputs. Once again, here's that function, now in the context of an entire sketch. So this is an Arduino sketch that could uh, run and use this function. The required part includes the setup and loop functions. They're rather familiar by now. And the function block is in the same .ino file, but it's logically separated as a function. Every function has a name. In this case, we're going to call our function sensor average. And that function name shows up in the declaration, the very first line of the function. Uh, the name of the function has to be a character string. The rules for naming functions are the same as the rules for naming Arduino variables. So uh, use characters, don't use spaces, don't use mathematical operators. Another part of the function declaration is the type. This determines what the function returns. So you've seen void setup and void loop before. Setup and loop return nothing. In other words, their return value is void or empty. In this case, we want to return the average of the readings, and it's natural to call that a float variable, allowing for, because you're averaging many, many integer values, it's reasonable that you would not get an integer as a result, so you'd return a float. Inside the function, we do operations, and the last line where it says return av, the last line is where the result of those uh, calculations get passed back out to the calling function. So the calling function is expecting a float by because of the nature of the function definition, and so we have to provide it internally with a value that's a float. The yellow box defines the range of statements that are inside the function called sensor average. We call this the body of the function and the body is delineated by curly brackets, an open curly bracket at the start and a closed curly bracket at the end. Of course, we can have loops and other things that use curly brackets inside, but the outermost brackets define the body of the function. In computer science, the function is said to have a scope, and, it, and inside that scope, variables uh, can use each other and be combined with each other. So av, sum, int i, int pin, int n read are all available inside the scope of sensor average, and av, sum, int i are not available outside the scope. So the scope refers to this walled effect of the function body isolating memory and therefore variables from other functions. This is a reminder that you should use white space, that you should think about making indentations and skipping lines in your code to make your code easier to read. Not required, strongly recommended. Input arguments that are defined in the function definition line, in this case, pin and nread, 
those are the input arguments. Those input arguments are available inside the body of the function. They're declared by type in, this, in the function definition line. int pin is used down inside the analog read function, and int and read is used in the for loop and also at the very end when computing the average. So those input arguments have to be in that statement have to be defined by type and name in the function definition statement. When the function is called, the names of the variables do not need to be the same. The way to think about this is that the function values are passed by position, the order in which they appear, not their name. So inside the loop function, sensor pin has the value of 3 and n av has the value of 15. When sensor av is called, sensor pin is the first argument and nav e is the second argument. Therefore, the value the value stored in sensor pin is given to pin inside the function. The value in nav is given to the internal variable and read at the time the function is executed. So pin and n read are available inside the function. They know nothing about the named variable sensor pin or the named variable nav. They only need they only know the values that were given to the function at runtime. So we're back to our black box. Sensor av functions as a black box with two placeholders for inputs. The first placeholder is a sensor pin number. The second placeholder is the number of readings to average. When you call the function, the names don't matter. It's the place, the order in which they appear. Similarly, the internal name that's computed as the average doesn't matter. That value is passed back to the calling statement. We're going to make a plea for avoiding global variables. It's, um, it's something that happens when people write code. They say, oh, I can't figure out input arguments. The heck with it. If I make all my variables global, then I don't have to worry about it. Well, that defeats one of the primary values of using functions, which is isolating the code. So global variables bypass input arguments. It could be a quick fix, but quick fixes often cause problems later. One case in beginning Arduino code where this is almost unavoidable is that the simple use of digital outputs, when you declare digital output, you declare it's how it's configured in the setup function, and then you use it again inside the loop function. So a global variable is important there, or it's necessary there for simple configurations because the global variable has no way of being set and then returned by setup and loop. Setup and loop have no input arguments, they have no output arguments. So global variables, global variables are the only way around that. In general, however, we want to restrict communication to input and output variables. That may require some thinking, but it's always a, a good outcome. Code will ultimately be more robust when you do that. So whenever possible, wherever possible, avoid global variables. Use function input and output arguments instead. So let's summarize. Function type, that line at the very beginning, the type of the function determines what is returned. Not the name of what is returned, just the, the type the type of value. Void functions return nothing. Examples besides setup and loop are when you want to write a function to print values to a serial monitor. Maybe there's some complicated formatting before you want to print those values. Other examples would be to update an LCD panel, which has several lines of positioning arguments about where to put the individual characters on the screen. So those are nice examples where there's no need to return a value, hence the type of function is void, but additional work gets done inside the function with the values that are passed to it in the inputs. Int and float functions uh, return numerical values, and those are very handy when you want to do a calculation that returns especially single values. So we just saw that we can use it to a function to compute the average of an input. Another good example is when we want to evaluate a calibration equation. For example, to convert a thermistor reading to a temperature, there is a polynomial function with some constants with lots of digits. You can, you can hide those coefficients inside the function. The user gives it the function a value, say the analog read value of a pin, and you return the temperature. 
and that's very handy to keep the uh, constants associated with that thermistor out of the way of all the rest of the code. Function inputs are determined by position, not by name. You have to have the types of each variable lining up. So the first variable is an int, the second variable is a float. That matters. Also, the value that gets passed in first will be assigned to a particular value. So the types and the calling sequence need to match up. The name of the arguments do not need to match. Functions in this way are like black boxes. We don't need to know how the function works as long as we use the inputs and outputs correctly. Function bodies are isolated code blocks, isolated in the sense that those tasks inside the function allow us to make the code modular, so we don't need to worry about the details. The body of the function has an isolated scope, meaning that the variables in the function are limited to that scope. Local variables cannot be affected by external code blocks unless the local variables refer to global variables. So in general, you want to avoid global variables because it breaks down this advantage of limiting the scope of a variable. Functions allow reuse. We can have function code that can be copied into new sketches. You can copy it and store it in an external file. And eventually, if you pursue Arduino programming at a higher level, you can build your own libraries. So that's our summary of user-defined functions. They're not that hard to use once you get the hang of them, and they have a very good positive effect on the portability, debugability, and modularity of your code.